In this lecture, we are going to cover plots and uh, how they are useful for understanding uh, different types of data. So why should we even worry about uh, looking at plots? Well, in order to understand data, we need to take it and understand it and visualize it. So the plots are merely the functionality that we use to visualize our data. So the learning objectives of this uh, video lecture is that you should know a little bit about the terminology of the data that we have. So what is a response variable? What is an explanatory variable? What is univariate, bivariate and multivariate data? What is correlation? And the plots, the plots that we're going to go through are the most common ones and how they're used. And that is histograms, box plot and jitter plots, line plots, stem plots, bar charts, pie charts, spline plots, and scatter plots. And how is descriptive statistics related to those plots? So, in terms of statistical terminology, a response variable is a variable that we measure or observe. So it's something that we can go out into the lab and figure out what is the value of some certain property of a food material, for instance. So that could be water content of cheese, how much alcohol there is in the wine, or the number of bacteria that we observe in the sample. Or it could also be a sensorical characteristics of a product, for instance, how bitter is the coffee. An explanatory variable is of a different nature. It's something that we control or something that is given. So some examples is the type of wine that we look at. Is it red? Is it white? The temperature in a fermentation experiment, that is something that we control. We want to ferment a product at two different temperatures, 20 degrees and 24 degrees. So we control the temperature. So that's an explanatory variable. It's not something that we measure. Or for instance, the type of coffee that we use for in a tasting experiment, something from south america and something from africa for instance then how much data is there univariate refers to that we have one response variable so that could be a bunch of explanatory variables but if we only measure one thing we talk about that we have univariate data bivariate is just above univariate that is where we have two response variables and then when we have more than two response variables we talk about multivariate data now we dig into the plots and I show this visualization in order just to show to you that plots can be used for very many things and you can give things which are really beautiful like this one and you can delve into it and understand different pieces of it. So for instance the size of the balls here refer to how many recipes scraping the net this particularly food stuff was found in. So this is vegetable and this is onion. So there's a lot of onion in all types of recipes. The edge between two dots here refer to how cool, how many times they go in pairs between different recipes. So garlic and onion goes together and black pepper and cayenne goes together and these are the spices we can see that on the color code so you can use a lot of time on such a plot to understand how are different food raw materials going into recipes and um, how are they connected we're not going to produce these plots today but um, it's just to give you a teaser for what plots can be used for so plots we talk about that we have some descriptive plots, which are called histograms, densitograms, box plot, data plots, and violin plots. They're used for continuous data and describes distributions. Then we have something called line plot or stem plot, also used for continuous data. And that's where we use the x-axis for something which are explanatory, for instance, time, and then we have on the y-axis something else. Then we have bar chart and pie chart. They're used for categorical data or compositional data. Scatter plots are used when we have more than one response variable and we want to see the relation. Spline plots is where we try to infer smooth relations between two or more variables. So now let's just take one at a time. So here we have a histogram showing the ethanol content over some distribution of samples. So there's 40 samples here, 
and we have recorded the ethanol content and it goes from 0 to 0 0.3 for all these 40 samples. And here we see that there is a lot of samples down in the low end and then it tails off at the high end. On top of this we can plot a smooth densitogram which tries to infer the distribution of the histogram. So we have the histogram that's the same and then the densitogram on top infers the distribution. So here we see the distribution of the samples. Well, we have the same data down here, it's ethanol, but now we just use the x-axis for inferring an explanatory variable, that's the country, Argentine, Australia, Chile, and South Africa. And we see here the box plot for the ethanol content for these four countries. So what is the box plot? Well, the box plot shows the distribution where it shows the fractiles, so the box here goes from the lower 25th fractile of the data, that is, the, if you take the data and count up to what is the number where I've, when I have the lowest one-fourth of the data, that's the 25th fractile. Then the median is here, and then at the top here is the 75th fractile. Then the the line here goes up to the minimum or maximum observation for all of them. So here we have some distribution and then the mean max for all the countries. A data plot is basically the raw data plotted, so each point is one sample. And then we have all the samples from Argentine here, we have all the samples from Australia here, and so forth. It's hard on the data plot to distinguish between the samples, so is this sample from Australia or from Argentine? It's hard to tell. So what is nice is that you can use the two plots together and plot them on top of each other. So that's what's done down here in Box and Data. So where we both get the distributional from the box plot as well as the single raw data points. Another versatile tool for this is using the violin plot. So that's basically a, a densitogram which is put on top, so flipped 90 degrees and then mirrored uh, in itself. So here we have the distribution. So there's more data down at the bottom here than on the top. And we see here there's only a few points up here. So how fat it is tells you how many points there are and reflects the distribution of the data. So it's where the box plus plot only refers to certain quantities of the distribution, the violin plot tries to capture all of it. Well, let's try to go into R and see how we actually can produce these plots. So I just start out by clearing my workspace. I don't want to see the, the plots which are here, so I remove that and I empty out what is in up here. So I have a preamble here where I need a library for the import of the data. So the read Excel is a function which goes in data. And then I, I need a library, the ddplot2, which is uh, a, re a really neat library for doing all these plots. So I need to read that in. And then I read in the data. So the wine data here is uh, 44 observations and 59 variables. We can just take a look at it. So what we have here is a bunch of response variable measuring all different types of aroma compounds. And then in the front, we also have a label, a class, which refers to the country as numbers, one, two, three, four, and the country code. So the first three variables are used for that. Okay, we want to make a histogram. So we use the qplot function. We tell it to look in the wine data and we want to see the if uh, no content. Let's try to see how that works. So by default, uh, the ddplot or the qplot function here interprets this as well. There's one response variable. So I might guess that he wants to plot a histogram. I can also tell if I'm uncertain whether it will understand me to plot the histogram like this. 
or I can change it to density to get the density gram. Or I can combine the two by saying, well, I want two types of plots, so I want the histogram and the density gram. So here we have both on top of each other. Well, there were four countries and these are not reflected by this pr plot at all. So let's try to make a box plot where we use the country country uh, on the x-axis and the ethanol on the y-axis and let's see what happens. Well here it just plots the points so the raw data and that's pretty hard to look at so let, let, let's just get it as a box plot. So we say the geom so that's the geometric that the um, is plotted it's a block plot. So here we have the box plot. We can decorate this one. We can say, well, it's nice to have the x-axis with the countries, but I really also like to see the countries reflected in color. So I can put in fill and then I'll get redundant information because the x-axis and the color is exactly the same, but the plot might be more beautiful. I could say, well, I would like it, this to be a jitter plot, and then I just change it to jitter out here, or I can do the same trick as above and say, well, I want a box plot in the bag and then the raw data on top of that, and then I'll get something like this. So this is really useful. Back to the presentation. The jitter plot shows the raw data which is always nice when you have a few samples because then you can go in and check single samples and say well that's that might be an outlier that's a really high sample or this one up here from Chile what is the matter with this one is is it correctly measured for instance so raw data inspection is always nice and it's uh, extremely feasible if you have few data uh, to just plot them on, on top of a box plot the box plot and the violin plot can handle many observations. You don't need, you cannot see from this plot whether you have 10 observations or 1000 observations, and the same goes for this one. Um, but you should know that, that they can cheat in representation of the raw data simply because you don't show it. And it's easy to see up here that you have actually a density where there's no observations. So in this area, there's no observations, but the density tells you that there is still probability of this observation. So be aware of this um, limitation. Line plot, here's an example of line plot. So we measure the salt content in a production. So what we see is that it goes up and down. So it follows some cyclical stuff. Then something happens here and then it's stable. So maybe the process is shut down while the machinery is still running, or maybe there's uh, something wrong here. So if we just plot the salt content without this time information, it will be really hard to see the cyclic um, shape of the data as well as this peak here. So it's used in something called Statistical Process Control, SPC, and it's excellent for capturing what we call drift, where that, that is systematical change over time. So this, for instance, here is a systematical change over time, and that could be a production, but it could also be in a laboratory. If you have if you go in in the morning and you light up your machine and then you see that it drifts over the day, then you have a problem. The bar chart and the pie chart are used for compositional or categorical data. So here are some, some compositional data where we try to characterize a bean dry matter composition. And it's distributed into these five groups, as fiber, lipid, protein, and what's left. And it's the exact same information that is in these three plots. So here on top of each other, they sum to 100. Here as a pie chart where they are summing to the total area of the circle and here next to each other. One thing that you should be aware of is that you can use such a bar plot here to plot the mean, but it's simply wrong to replace a box plot by the mean of something um, which is not compositional or categorical, so be aware of that. 
scatter plot, which is I would say the most useful plot when we deal with a lot of data. And what we plot here is that we have the ethanol content of a bunch of wines, so the, here are the wines over here, versus the butanol, so two different alcohols versus each other, and it seems like that when one goes up, the other one follows, but it's not a perfect line. We use these for two response variables to plot them versus each other, and it's very, very useful for multivariate data. When we have, let's try to do this in R. So we have these data where we have several different variables. Let's just clear out here, call names and check what we have. So here are all the variables. So let me just try to plot. I want to see the exact same plot. So I want ethanol content versus this one. And let's see how that goes. So here we get the points plotted. So that's how easy it is. So I use the first argument in here, that's for the x-axis, and the second one is for the y-axis. And if I change the two, then I'll get something quite similar, just flipped. So let me change it back. Okay, back to the presentation. So when we represent a relation between two variables, we might want to put on top of this relation, on the top of the raw data, some kind of trend line reflecting whether there is relation between the variables in a linear fashion, how stable it is, so is the relation stronger at some point, um, but we could also infer something which is called a spline, which is a smooth relation. So it might not necessarily be linear, this relation, but more like, well, it behaves like this. And then on the other side of the ethanol um, area or distribution, the, the relation between the two variables are stronger compared to the lower side. So this is called a spline plot. And let's try to see how that is done in R. So we have here the plot with the relation between the two variables and on top of this one we put this smooth stat smooth so what i do is i put a statistics so this is something inferred from the data so a line or a spline and smooth because it should not be bumpy all over the place but be linear or at least smooth so let's see what happens so here we'll get this plot we can say, well, I would like this one to be a linear model. And by the LM uh, argument, I enforce that the relation between the two is linear. And then we will get this one on. We could say, well, it annoys me that I have these, uh, whatever it is, confidence bands around the line, so I can remove those by saying, well, I don't want SE, that refers to standard error, some measures of uncertainty, and I can turn them on off by putting the false statement by writing false or writing just if. That's it.